Good evening, uh, bonsoir. It's a pleasure for me to be here. My name is Katja Meyer. I have a double hat on today. I speak uh, as a researcher at the University of Vienna, Austria, where I'm in the Department of Science and Technology Studies, but also as a scientist at Center for Social Innovation in Vienna, where in the last years, we, my colleagues are somewhere, hi. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, where we have conducted several projects that deal with many of the issues that are raised by this wonderful event here that I'm enjoying very much. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, since we have no time, I, I immediately start with a quote that I noted down uh, to today in the morning, no, in the, well, in, at noon. Somebody said as a reaction, I think, to the round table, it's, it's easy to connect things nowadays. Is it? Um, and my keynote will probably be something like an awareness raising exercise, awareness for infrastructures. Infrastructures as understood through the lens of Susan Lee Starr and others are deeply relational. In line with this notion, we will understand infrastructures as socio-technical assemblages, assemblage. Bruno Latour, entangling diverse epistemic cultures, institutional settings, materialities, and resources, as well as social relationships. And in my talk, as it is my role as science and technology studies scholar, I will delve into some of the multifaceted challenges of digital research infrastructures tailored for and in participatory approaches in citizen science. You will see some lists, I apologize for that, uh, I, but I'm currently uh, creating an ontology on characteristics of open data practices and infrastructures for my research project, so I'm living in these lists. But I've put some cartoons next to the lists for you, so uh, also it might be a rather high-level abstraction across all types of digital infrastructures that you will see in these lists. Uh, uh, but I wanted that as many as po uh, of you as possible will find themselves in there and your infrastructures. And I will anyway share the slides. The slides are all more like a background information to what I'm saying. So I will share them afterwards. No need to read all of it. Uh, just go for the cartoons. Um, so um, some of the infrastructural challenges might sound very, uh, might sound very familiar with the Coeso team. And today I found something really nice, which you can get at the info desk. It's a, it's an infrastructure. It's a depiction of an infrastructure on a postcard. And I, this is my first infrastructure postcard from a, from a participatory research aspect uh, lens scene. So I'm, I will send this to some of my colleagues and they, they will be pretty stunned, I guess. So some of the infrastructural challenges might sound very familiar uh, to many here in the room, and they certainly touch upon several ethical dimensions that are investigated and implemented in the context of pro-ethics. But of course, they go far beyond the realms of these projects and bring to light some of the fundamental challenges with infrastructural configurations, both potentially enabling and often inadvertently undermining inclusive participatory paradigms within the social sciences and humanities. First slide. So participatory approaches in the SSH, very generalized, mostly entail these dimensions as shown here. Uh, but I think from the points on this slide and as has been talked about today, we can derive a value set and the big question is now, how do infrastructures reflect these dimensions? So before we come to the emblematic dualism of the title of this talk and the question of how infrastructures can act as bridges or breaches, we need to ask what do we mean by research infrastructures for participatory SSH and citizen science, in particular digital infrastructures. These are tools, services and procedures that support the active involvement of the subject of study, local communities, and other non-academic stakeholders in the research process, as well as the collaboration among these actors with researchers. Such infrastructures should therefore reflect the values of different types of knowledge and expertise, of course, and help to democratize the research process, making it more inclusive, equitable, and relevant for all actors involved. The bridge metaphor in this context then uh, embodies the transformative potential of these methodologies to seamlessly connect 
diverse issues, actors, and epistemologies, fostering collaboration, mutual understanding, mutual learning. Conversely, breach signifies the pitfalls, particularly issues of trust and sustainability. When infrastructures fail to be safe, but transparent, inclusive or adaptive, they can erode trust, alienating participants. And uh, so, so infrastructures in that sense don't only connect, but they can also break, disconnect and set apart relations, and we should always be aware of that. So in this delicate balancing act of doing participatory research for the social good, that you're all familiar with, no doubt, infrastructures often, often add additional burdens on all actors, mostly either because they are not have been accounted for enough in the planning phase or because they are not working out as intended. I guess all of you have come across these problems. And as a peer reviewer for a lot of funding things, I also know infrastructures mostly belong to the rather under-reflected parts of the proposals. I completely understand this as they often require expertise that is not at all present at the core team for the proposal writing and are later outsourced anyway. In this talk, I will therefore try to sensitize you, the audience, to the challenges, but nevertheless, hopefully, make you see also the many benefits, if planned well, that uh, infrastructures provide to participatory settings. So what types of infrastructures are we talking about here? So first, uh, as I said, through the lens of Susan Lee Starr et al, infrastructure is a broader term. It's encompassing both the tangible and intangible components which provide a foundational environment for socio-technical services to operate. So this includes all the things that you can read on there. And uh, the, the, like all the structures that make them operate efficiently, securely, in alignment with intended purposes, along uh, legal frameworks, and so on and so forth. And when we discuss digital infrastructure, maybe even public infrastructures in the sense that they are financed by public money or run by public actors, especially in the context of research, governance and management are integral components and also sometimes totally underrated or overlooked. Acknowledging these dimensions, we learn that the human and organizational elements are crucial if we want to see treat an infrastructure like an ecosystem. And it Acknowledging this highlights that infrastructure is definitely not just about technology, but about how the technology is deployed, maintained, and integrated into wider context. But, and there again, I'm with Susan Lee Starr, one person's infrastructure is another person's topic or another person's difficulty. And I think this is a, is a very wise sentence that we should all keep in mind. Um, you can, you can think about a bridge. A bridge for many stands as an emblem of dependable infrastructure, right? Uh, something like a, like a chair we don't think about when we use it. Most who commute over it daily do so without giving it a second thought. It's simply a reliable path from one point to another. Yet for the traffic engineer, for example, overseeing the upkeep of the bridge, this bridge is not just part of the background, it's in the forefront of his or her responsibility. Meanwhile, to a cyclist or a pedestrian, the very same bridge might pose a challenge, especially if it lacks the features that would ensure for the safety, such as dedicated bike lanes or walkways. So it's, of course, first of all, important what type of participation is needed and then it's important only then to look for adequate socio-technology. Because there are a lot of options, as you can see on this slide, and there are even more than here. Um, uh, I will chuck, just pick the chatbots. Ha, what a, what a nice coincidence that we were just reading chatbot text. So I will just pick the, the chatbot here for you to, to uh, kind of illustrate where we are at the moment with digital uh, infrastructures and technologies that are really quite complicated, even though they have a simple interface. Um, so the chatbots are certainly a coming interface for participatory research, and we urgently need to experiment with this socio-technology more to derive better insights 
on their benefits and limitations. And uh, when you kind of, for example, use collaborative publishing platforms, you know, when you read it here, then of course this is entailing the typical types of publishing reviewing that we know from academia. But for truly collaborative research or for truly participatory research, it requires more. It requires versioning, it requires different formats for dissemination, not in the traditional academic sense, but providing for types of outputs and feedback, like blogging platforms, social media. Opening up means for translatory practices. Remember, we talked today about how uh, participants are not always so interested in academic publications. Maybe we should turn it around and think more about how we can involve ourselves in a kind of publishing world, dissemination world that is much more interesting for the participants. Documenting research performance is another really important topic um, that is important for participatory research, but not as in current research information systems, but also making it relevant for the participants. So I'm looking forward to learn more about cooperation analytics as experimented with in COESO. But also think about, for example, biodiversity or health research monitoring dashboards based fully or partly on citizen or patient-generated data, which should cater to the needs of the communities of practice. Many of these tools can be combined or integrated depending on the specific needs and objectives of a participatory social science project or humanities especially large research infrastructures, like uh, also operas has uh, a long uh, tradition with. And uh, these kind of infrastructures are broadening at the moment their participatory capacities. And this is also an interesting aspect we will come uh, to later. But how can social science and humanities infrastructures become more participatory? And by the way, also more open uh, in a meaningful way. Before we learn about this, we should have a more concrete look at the infrastructures already at work, those we have experience with. And we already use many of these, and some of them are already at hand, but some of them have to create it from sketch, of scratch, maybe as pilots. You know this, like, um, especially when you're a reviewer, this sentence, oh, not another pilot. <laughs> anyway, so I, I would say we need a lot of pilots still. Um, not all of these infrastructures were built for research, in particular not for inclusive participatory research, co-created by critical social scientists or humanities researchers who immediately understand their surveillance and control potential, the many biases inherent in their usage and so forth. Many of them are technological black boxes. We hardly can know about their generation and operation as proprietary systems. But there is more to understanding our infrastructures. With Susan Lee Starr and others, uh, we can uh, kind of look at infrastructures in a more fundamental way. She and others have introduced and developed critical insights on how we understand and study infrastructure. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to two concepts within this body of research that are very helpful also for us when dealing with infrastructure. It's the notion of infrastructuring and the perspective of breaking infrastructures. So infrastructuring is not just a noun, but also a verb. It's a continuous process. This insight has been especially influential in informing the design and maintenance of technological systems in various fields over the last years. Infrastructuring refers to the ongoing work of building but also maintaining and adapting and expanding and transforming infrastructures. It's not just about the initial creation of an infrastructure, which is so important always to put in the proposal, but there is so much more going on afterwards. It's about the evolution. It's about repair. It's about adaptation over time. So this concept emphasizes the dynamic, emergent and processual nature of infrastructures as opposed to viewing this as fixed and, fixed and static entities. And this is a perspective we urgently need to adopt if we haven't done so already. Oops, sorry. Oh, did you, s sorry, I was too fast, excuse me. Yeah, I gave you already the next, the breaking infrastructures. This is one of my favorite cartoons of all times, because this is reality. 
Many of you will know this. The notion of breaking infrastructures in STARS research draws attention to those moments when infrastructures often take it for granted or invisible when they work smoothly, also the chair, become noticeable, often due to failure or breakdown. So here we underscore the idea that infrastructures reveal their complexities, nuances and dependencies when they malfunction, when they feel to fail to meet the needs or expectations of user groups. And exactly examining these breaks, researchers can uncover the embedded assumptions, values and design decisions within them, as well as the power dynamics and all the other inequalities that manifest or perpetuate through infrastructures. These breaking points, uh, as they are called, uh, are when we can best discover the breaches, or what I would call breaches. And I would like to now uh, show you some um, examples of that, um, which are uh, really uh, the right moments of seeing, for example, biases, but also exclusory uh, practices, but also like, for example, seeing the hidden labor that upholds infrastructures. And those of you uh, dealing with infrastructures, you know, they break all the time, right? They break all the time, and basically a lot of work goes to into kind of maintaining a certain status and kind of uh, that certain uh, procedures work, so you all do your best to, to build them in such a resilient way that the users will not easily recognize or be impacted by the breaks. But this is exactly where it gets interesting. Breaches are often evoked by issues of trust. Uh, and sustainability, as I said before. They mostly stem from inadequate, uh, inadequate planning or implementation, sometimes also from unforeseeable changes, for example, in uh, operating systems. They can compromise the participatory setting itself, or in general, even the whole project's impact. Such failures in infrastructure can strain relationships and place added burdens to all involved actors but for the time's sake, I will not go through all these types. I just want to kind of sensitize you on a uh, particular focus, yeah? And uh, I, I chose the data perspective. And uh, there, this, I, I call it caring for data. So how caring for data has a lot of different dimensions, right? So those of you working with participatory infrastructures where, for example, citizens generate data, yeah? You know that participants who co-generate data for research are often not prepared that their data is not appearing on their devices in real time, right? Instead, they go through some validation pipes before. They become easily frustrated by the time this takes. This is very different to how they normally use their mobile phones. So preparatory training or good community management could help here, for example. Another aspect with data is, of course, data security, privacy, data leaks, or third-party tracking. YouTube, a very good example as for a video platform that is used a lot in the participatory settings. Um, last but not least, for example, there's the problem of disappearing data, uh, disappearing intermediaries, or even disappearing repositories. A study has recently shown that due to a lack of resources, a rising number of research data repositories had to close down and migrate to other infrastructures. All these are questions of data curation. Which data, for whom, when, is it possible, at which cost? Participatory research that cares for symmetry and benefits has to plan these questions in. They touch upon further questions of measuring engagement with data, data metrics, or as we learned today, cooperation uh, analytics. But they also open up the question what legal frameworks are in place when building onto existing commercial platforms, like YouTube, for example, or proprietary black boxes. Furthermore, the lens on data practices showed at several instances that too much participation is often hindering the infrastructure development. It gets too complicated, too multifaceted. Yet it is important to take the opportunity, of course, to involve the participatory elements in the development of whatever infrastructures we are talking about. And by the way, also in its evaluation. We come back to that. Now to the bridge metaphor. Bridges. 
I think, Muki, you today gave an example of the importance of multilinguality of the data collection platform uh, and highlighted the need to have uh, diversity across all infrastructural dimensions as well, uh, showing that there is no one-fits-all solution. Acknowledging this is already a first step into building bridges that may also work for cyclists and pedestrians. The central question is always, how can these infrastructures enable participation and learning that certain configurations of infrastructure can be more inclusive and conducive to public engagement? On this slide, you find really important focal points. As I said, many of them are familiar to you, I'm sure. And they represent, of course, the values of participatory research, but how to realize them best. I would like for now and for the sake of time just to pick two aspects. First, the question of governance and who has a stake in decision making. This is particularly important for large public research infrastructures, but also if you would like to build something with and for a community of practice, so something that lasts longer than the research project, right? Besides the consideration of lock-in effects, sustainable resources, as well as long-term concepts of interoperability, the moment the research infrastructure is transitioning to a community tool needs to be prepared well. The development of governance models takes time. Many of you will have experienced this and takes a lot of negotiations and discussions. And they need really good facilitation and then they still need to be adaptive to future changes uh, uh, and f uh, like uh, ensuring autonomy from undesired power imbalances. So, this, of course, requires, again, participatory uh, evaluation practices, which, again, are pretty laborious and should be well prepared. A lot of preparation for all these things. And in the best case, in the end, this infrastructure can be left with the community of practice, for example, as a monitoring and evaluation tool. So what I tried is, you know, you maybe some of you know these trust principles for digital repositories, because I like them and they are simple. I tried to adapt them for digital infrastructures for participatory research. So um, there are specific needs and challenges, we are aware of that, and uh, some of the trust principles have to adapt for them. Yeah, I will also not go into more detail here, but I would like to uh, kind of uh, bring your attention to a specific aspect again. I think it was Annelies to the Interplanetary Roundtable who underscored the expectations of funders and policymakers. Annelies, are you there? Yeah, I think it was you, right? And um, uh, how they anticipate comprehensive outcomes, encompassing work with marginalized communities, fostering inclusivity, generating uh, valid data, curating interactive exhibitions, and maybe even establishing intellectual property for innovation or whatever. <laughs> so they wanted to have it all. And the budget allocations always fall short of these expensive aims, right? So the emphasis uh, of this imperative nature of uh, judicious uh, resource allocation is really important, right? So given the considerable costs and the level of preparedness uh, to enter in all these challenges that I've just uh, mapped out for you uh, is really crucial. It is crucial to prioritize those elements that a project can realistically deliver while reframing for pursuing unattainable objectives. In this context, it is of course important to realize that funders and also peer reviewers are often not well prepared to understand the infrastructural dimension of participatory research. Some funders, especially in the field of basic research, would even say, we do not fund infrastructures. Ugh. What is therefore needed on all levels of participation as well as decision making is sort of a infrastructure literacy. That's also a very funny cartoon. They are hyper-literate <laughs> on what to do with infrastructures. This is not a good example how we should act. That is a bad practice, yeah? Uh, but they figured it out, of course, outsourcing everything. Instead, we need to emphasize the understanding of the processes of infrastructuring in participatory research. And here I, I again just picked out randomly basically some examples for such literacies. 
So example, uh, for example, researchers uh, that focus on, on meaningful documentation and measurement uh, and therefore countering the tendency in participatory research to totally withdraw from any metric. Digital infrastructures are also infrastructures of measurements, right? <laughs> they wouldn't work if there were not a lot of things that are measured all the time. So there is a heavy quantification going on and it's much better to be aware of it and to know about it and then maybe to intervene in it than to withdraw from it. Uh, participants recognize uh, and are trained in the capabilities, but also the limits of infrastructures, ensuring impactful outcomes, because they're involved in co-determining uh, what a successful impact of such a project would be. The public, whoever the public is, it's a, a not easy term, I know, could adopt novel strategies for civic engagement and really use these kind of tools to foster, for example, public discourse or data activism to kind of intervene in policy and regulation. And then, of course, policy would benefit a bit, as you uh, I probably will agree, from bringing research infrastructures more into the realms of political life. Whereas funders, as I said before, should learn to understand that participation needs certain kind of infrastructures and that should align with the respective values, because that is not so easy, that we make these infrastructures to be inclusive and uh, adhere to a lot of these participatory values. And now back to ChatGPT, right? Um, this is my last slide before the conclusion. Um, I squeeze it in. I squeeze in one little outlook, right? So just that you get the, uh, the, the, the taste of it. Um, how can participatory approaches enrich existing or forthcoming research infrastructures. I think there is a lot of need for that. And I also think the citizen science community is one of the best uh, prepared communities to talk about these things and should be involved in these things. How can we make chatbots a truly participatory infrastructure? What do you think? This would be a, a point for discussing uh, on the way to the dinner. Um, so urgent need for more participatory approaches in AI research and vital to learn from our experiences with digital infrastructure so far to put some kind of participatory artificial intelligence into practice. Um, I am concluding now. I don't know if I'm in time. I don't see any clock. It's okay? Good. So, um, what we need is more careful infrastructuring. That would be the conclusion of my lecture today. Quite simple. In academic context, it's imperative to understand that infrastructures are not simply constructed once and then left unchanged. You won't believe how many times I encounter this rather, I would say, naive stance. Our scholarship has yet to fully grasp the nuances of maintaining, adapting, and governing these infrastructures in such a manner that relevant communities retain decision-making autonomy, as well as the necessary flexibility to adapt and interoperate with coming technologies. Again, field of artificial intelligence would be a good example, and also the, my favorite cartoon with the stacking of all these different tools on one another and the past dependencies that arise from that. Um, it's complicated, right? So thinking deeper about what types of participation you are infrastructuring in your projects or institutions and whether or not these infrastructures should be available also beyond the time space of a project will provide a very interesting lens for you to reflect on the participatory research, a socio-technical endeavor more generally. Sometimes it's already challenging, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, to do this only for the data infrastructures, for example, in use, right? Uh, it's already challenging sometimes for such projects to make a data management plan or anything like that, that is even sometimes uh, going to our limits. But it's, it, when it's there, and I guess some of you will also acknowledge that, it's a, it can be a very useful tool. 
and it makes us think differently about the projects that we conduct. So it's, a, it's actually like considering all these aspects is already a really good exercise to build robust methodology and tools. And in order to ensure the digital research infrastructures or others used for research, not dedicated research infrastructures, but also, I don't know, social media, for example, in order to, to kind of uh, treat them right, we need to foster both the robustness and the reliability of the research, of their integration in the research process. And we should, of course, enhance um, their inclusivity and therefore engage in careful infrastructures. This also means not losing sight of the values of participatory research and citizen science, but also understanding the potential to challenge um, traditional academic formats, by the way, formats of expertise, formats of data, and thus allowing for richer diversity of perspectives and facilitating a much more holistic understanding of complex phenomena. So, last words, call call for action if you like. Yeah? This also means you should be now encouraged, first of all, to plan for iterative co-design of such infrastructure, not the fully infrastructure has to be fully co-designed. You have to find those spots, breaking points, potential breaking points, whatever, to kind of uh, uh, develop together with technologists, developers, but also community members, participants, and based on a lot of feedback and research inside, uh, the basic infrastructure that is needed, the socio-technical infrastructures. Yeah? And it's even more important the larger the infrastructure. You should be encouraged to push for increased transdisciplinary collaboration while adequately acknowledging engagement, of course. And you should be encouraged to advocate for ethical frameworks for such infrastructures not only to be integrated in the design and implementation, but also equip relevant actors with the knowledge about relevant principles, the trust principles, in maintaining, adapting, repairing infrastructures. Right? So, wrapping up, it's imperative to highlight that the essence of participatory research isn't just about the tools or systems in place. We can be, I mean, I think also Pierre has said this in the morning. It's all about people and and the interactions these infrastructures foster. As you engage or develop with infrastructures, always prioritize reflection and collaboration and a more dynamic focus on infrastructuring. Thank you. <laughs> there is time for questions? No, I think we go. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, yeah. Was that, that was, was no questions, that. yes. We follow what Alessia said and we will discuss we will discuss on the way to the dinner. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs>